Hi, my name is Bruce Bolger, and I'm founder of the Enterprise Engagement Alliance, a 16-year-old organization dedicated to helping organizations enhance performance through a strategic and systematic uh, process of managing all stakeholders toward a common purpose, goals, and objectives. And what we do as part of our effort is share free education. And in this case, we've launched a new series with Jackie Baskow, CEO of Baskow or Basco Talent, on meaningful meetings. Meetings are one of the most powerful engagement tools, but how can we make them more effective in a day and age where we can do a lot through digital meetings just like this? When we get people together, we want to create meaningful experiences. So this new series features people like Nick Santanasuso, and Nick, I may have pronounced that name, uh, you'll, you know, uh, you'll correct us in one minute, and he's a business and life coach who has taken a life disability and turned it into an opportunity to share wisdom with all of us. And he's a very successful corporate speaker, and we're going to learn about what he's learned in life and how he brings that to life in corporate events. And Jackie, of course, is our co-host, and she helps me make sure that we get all the right answers from our terrific guests. And I always like to just say a quick thank you to all the companies that do business with us that help support your efforts to improve enhancement. Uh, engagement, I should say. And finally, we give away an awful lot of resources. Just go to enterpriseengagement.org. You'll find books, white papers, articles, media platforms, everything you know to put purpose into practice. So now with a little bit of help of technology, I am going to uh, stop the share. And let's get to Nick. Uh, Nick and Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. I'm having one more little, this is really kind of a uh, gremlin day, but here we go. <laughs> so Nick, uh, I really don't want to dwell too much on uh, your disability because this is really about everything you've learned, but quickly just give us a, uh, the disability that you were born with and the decisions that your parents took that in a way changed your life and ours. Yeah, absolutely, Bruce. So in 1996, my parents went in for a late ultrasound and they sat them down, they pulled the baby up on the screen and suddenly, suddenly everybody started to freak out. And they said, well, from the looks of it, it doesn't look like your baby's limbs are being developed. It looks like he's missing his legs. It looks like he's missing his arms. And in specific, his face is messed up. Now, clearly, they lied about my face. My face is handsome. And so the, <laughs> the experts lied there. And what they did was they classified me with what we call Hanhart syndrome. And Hanhart syndrome is a super rare genetic disorder that either leaves the babies with undeveloped limbs or undeveloped organs. So at the time of my birth in 1996, I was the 12th baby in medical history that they've ever seen this happen to. And out of the 12, eight of those babies unfortunately passed away due to undeveloped organs. And so they were, they were born with undeveloped organs where they can't eat on their own, they can't breathe on their own, and they later on pass away. And so my parents made that the decision to focus on the 30% chance of me living versus the 70% chance of me passing away. That was a massive decision that they made. They went throughout the birth. I came out. They did tests on my organs. My organs came back 100% healthy. And the only thing that was affected were my limbs. So I was born with no legs, a short right arm, and one left arm with one finger. And so the unicorn is here. He's alive. He's healthy. And he's uh, impacting the world in the way that he can. Well, that's an amazing story. And it says a tremendous amount about your parents, of course. Uh, so let me tell you this. Again, this whole show is about lessons. So we're, I kind of get an impression. You obviously, it's tough enough to be a kid growing up anywhere on earth, but it had to be a little bit tougher for you. What are some of the lessons you drew from, from your experience as a kid that made you what you are today? And, and maybe what role did your parents play in that besides being just obviously amazing human beings? Yeah, absolutely. So my greatest strength was my parents treated me look just like my other siblings. So what I mean by that is my parents knew that if they put stepping stools everywhere and they put little loops on the zippers and they made everything easy, that I would have got smacked in the face by reality when I left the house or my parents weren't around. And so, you know, for example, there was two specific things that really cultivated my brain at an early age. The first one was they would put my clothes in front of me and say, Nick, figure it out. You know, they would give me verbal suggestions, but they wouldn't dress, you know, at a certain age, they wouldn't dress, for, they wouldn't dress me, you know, they would make me dress myself. And another example was they would put me in my high chair, they would put food there, they would put the spoon and say, have at it. Now, at the time, <laughs> I didn't know what they were doing. And it probably made me a little bit upset. But as I reflect back as an adult, it was really two things that they really cultivated my brain to do. 
The first one, and this, this goes into business as well. The first one is they programmed me to be solution oriented, meaning like, Nick, we have some challenges, we have some problems, but if you shift your focus from the problem to the solution, you're going to find ways to dress yourself. You're going to find ways to feed yourself. You're going to find ways to get on the couch. And ultimately, if you look in business, the most successful business owners or organizations are solution oriented. They spend very little time focusing on the problem and they spend most of their energy focused on the solutions and how they're going to execute on it. So that was the first lesson. The second lesson was I became very familiar with failure. You see, you can have all your arms and all your legs, yet you're still handicapped and crippled by your upbringing. And if you're not exposed to failure or you're not exposed to challenges and how to deal with those challenges, you tend to run from problems and disruption. So ultimately, at a very early age, failure became my best friend. And I realized that it was just part of the process, because if I'm honest, I failed at everything. My life is a bunch of failures led to a success. I failed at getting on the couch. I failed at dressing myself. I failed at feeding myself. I failed at business. I failed at content. I failed at speaking. And I understood that failure was part of the process. And the faster that I failed, the faster that I get feedback. And the faster that I get feedback, the faster that I can figure out a game-winning strategy to win. So, and Jackie, we're going to get into how he shares with this with events, but this is super important right here. Basically, what you're saying is that failure can be a strength. 100%. I think I think it's the, it's the meaning we give failure. So for example, if the meaning that you give failure is that you're doing something wrong, you're going to try to keep this perfect winning streak. You're trying to do everything perfect. You don't want to take any risk. You want everything to be perfect, all sunshine and rainbows. But what if you shifted the meaning of failure? And what if every single time that you experience failure, that was a sign from whoever, from your creator or your path that you were moving in the right direction? So what if something what what if failure was something that you leaned into because you knew you were on the right direction versus something that you ran away from? And so I think it's the meaning that people attach to failure that really dictates how much risk and how much implementation or execution they're going to do in their life. So uh, you you talk a lot um, about in in your work about the importance of mentors. And I'm curious about that because it sounds like your parents were great mentors in a way, right? They guided you. They didn't do it for you. They guided you. But tell us a little bit about the role of mentors and why do you mention that in, in your background? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I'm a firm believer that we're all standing on the giants or all stand, standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, the the Jim Rohns and the Zig Ziglers and the Tony Robbins. I mean, there was there was information that was trickled down years and years and years to help people get to the next level. But let's put it like this way. There's a few things why mentors are so important. The first thing is most of us growing up in our childhood, maybe the reason why we're playing it safe because we didn't have evidence that maybe business was possible. Maybe we didn't have evidence that healthy relationships were possible. Maybe even we didn't have evidence that making a specific amount of money was possible because no one in your family ever did it. So one of the things that mentors do is they show you evidence of a life that maybe you never thought was possible. That's the first thing. The second thing is, your time and your energy are your two most valuable assets because you can never get them back. And one of the greatest ways for you to really leverage your time and energy is to find someone who already has the life and the results that you want and get the information that they have. Because if someone is already doing what you want to do at a high level, they can show you the roadblocks, they can show you the strategies, they can show you the frameworks so you can collapse time. Because I don't know about you, but I'm trying to go further faster. I'm not trying to go slow. We're going to all expire one day. And I'm trying to get from A to Z as fast as possible. And one of the greatest ways is to get a mentor. The other reason why mentors are so valuable is because sometimes you don't believe in yourself. And if you don't believe in yourself, you can borrow your mentor's belief. I mean, how many times have someone in your life believed in you more than you believed in yourself? And so I tell my even my students or the corporate trainings that I do, if you don't believe if you don't believe in yourself right now, please borrow my belief because I can see a version of yourself that you haven't seen yet. And then I think the last really important reason that mentors are valuable is because when you're really intentional about mentors, you have to be very conscious of who you're learning from. If I could be direct, I think there's a lot of people that are teaching money advice who don't have money. I think there's a lot of people teaching relationship advice who don't have healthy relationships. I think a lot of people teaching business who don't have businesses. And so when you're very intentional about who you listen to, your life can change in a positive way or your life can change in a not so good way. And so what I would say, and ending, ending off on this question, is make sure the people that you're learning from actually are living the life that you want. And that will be your way to get to the next level further faster. Wow. 
Jackie, uh, before I go on with questions, um, uh, you, one of the things you, when you recommended Nick, you said you got to get Nick uh, because he's transformational on a stage and people have to get a sense of that. So before I go into learning some more about why Nick is um, a transformational on the stage, why did you recommend him? Well, uh, Nick and his manager, Rat, came into my office and I fell in love with both of them. And I and I saw the sizzle reel and I thought, oh, he'd be a great speaker, but nothing like seeing him in person and not because he's on this podcast. He changed my life. He changed. I had people following us, men following us, literally crying. They wanted to just talk to him for five minutes because he started out his speech with how many of you are angry out there? And Bruce, the whole damn room was saying, I'm angry. I hate this. I hate that. It was it blew my mind at the very end of his speech he goes into a meditation where you go in and you talk to your inner child and and harboring we all harbor like oh my mother liked me more than you or my boss hates me or whatever and we did this meditation and at the end people were crying because i know i released a childhood fear and um it was a, a big deal i mean everybody was so emotional and so it's like you purged all the negativity out of your body, all your fears, everything you were holding on to. And I can't say enough. I can't wait to see him again, personally, and his speech. I could sit through it every day, not because he's my client, because he changed my life and others. And we're going to get into a little bit about how you do that. But before I do that, um, you say in, in re reading about your background that you've been exploring uh, neuro-linguistic programming. Could you explain what that is and why it's relevant to you? Yeah, absolutely. And, and before I go right into NLP, the reason why I have all these credentials is because I believe there's two types of individuals in business and entrepreneurship. You have puddles and you have wells. And the truth is everybody starts off as a puddle. And what a puddle is, is someone who's a, a mile wide and an inch deep, meaning they don't have much mastery. They don't have much knowledge. They don't have much expertise. And that's totally okay. But if you commit your life to becoming a well of knowledge, not in a million things, but just in a few things, when you dig your well so deep, people pay you a lot of money to condense time because you're now the expert and the authority in your field. I always tell people I'm one step away from stupid. Meaning that I don't know a lot about everything. I know a lot about human behavior. I know a lot about the brain and I know a lot about a communication. And that's why people come to me for those specific things. Now, starting speaking at 20 years old, I heard all of, you know, through the chit chats and behind the scenes, I've heard things like he'll never be over a $5,000 speaker. He only gets stages because he's disabled. Um, he has no college experience. It has no business degree. He has no, he has this or that. And what I did was instead of letting those stones or those limiting beliefs dictate my life, I said, okay, you don't think I'm tactical enough? Thank you for the motivation. I'm going to become extremely tactical. I'm going to become extremely knowledgeable. I'm going to become a well of knowledge. And so I committed my whole, I'm 28 years old. I committed my whole entire 20s to learning NLP, which is neuro-linguistic programming, the language of the brain, um, timeline therapy, inner child work, neuroplasticity, unwiring and rewiring the brain. I've done all of this so I can serve people at the deeper level. But also, the more knowledge you have, the more confidence you'll have. It's, it, I, I know it sounds so simple, but who would have thought that the more you know about a subject, the easier it is to speak about it. And so I dedicated all of my life to psychology and communication. That's why it's effortless for me. But I wanted to, to acquire all of the tools and all of the healing modalities. So regardless of what your net worth is, what your corporation is, what your background, what your beliefs are, that I have a tool for you that's gonna allow you to break through to the next level. So I really just overcompensated because I didn't feel good enough. If I could be vulnerable, I think most of my success came from not feeling enough. And so I wanted to build big things, big credentials. I wanted more knowledge. So I'd finally feel loved and love myself. But ultimately, it allowed me to build an, an arsenal of tools that I can help people transform regardless of where they're at. I'm going to meet them where they're at. So, again, before we uh, conclude with really getting into that, um, tell us a little bit about what NLP is. Yeah, neurolinguistic programming it basically means the language of the mind. And so what NLP is, is your ability to ask the right questions to identify blind spots in people, access the subconscious mind or the unconscious thoughts, the patterns, the limiting beliefs, the stories that are keeping them stuck, and then 
redirecting them with the right questions so they can find their own healing. They can find their own breakthroughs. They can find their own insights. They can find their own awareness because the truth is a healer isn't someone that you go to for healing. A healer is someone that triggers you to heal yourself. And so I'm just equipped with NLP to figure out your model of the world. What are your roadblocks? What are your challenges? What are your triggers? And then put a mirror up so you can see yourself and you can work through your own trauma and your own blocks. So it sounds like, and this now is a great segue to really what I want to talk about, the lessons of your life, right? Um, people, you, Jackie made the point that in, people are often, you know, if they admit it, they're angry, they're upset. They're angry. In fact, I have a theory that all of this, and we're totally nonpartisan, our organization is totally nonpartisan, but I have a feeling that people are misdirecting their anger. They think that it's at one party versus the other. No, I think what they're really angry at is just life is hard. The businesses don't care about them. Their bosses don't care about them. They've got family challenges. Customer service is horrendous. Everybody's angry, spends a half an hour per week just on stupidity. So I think there's a lot of anger and, and, and unhappiness is so share with us it sounds like you help people deal with that is that tell us a little bit about the wisdom that you've taken away from your own experiences that you try to share uh, with people at these corporate events yeah absolutely yeah the, the the truth is that all of us are handicapped in one way or another but most of us is mental we're handicapped with our beliefs we're handicapped with our stories we're handicapped because we're addicted to specific emotions that we don't know that are not serving us triggers, blocks, trauma, all of the things. So we're all struggling, right? And once we level level the, the, the playing field here, we understand that everybody's struggling. So it opens up a safe container. But for example, one of the greatest lessons that I had to learn as a man with no legs of an arm, just as a child, and then as an adult and in business, is that you can only control what you can control. And if you really want to bring more groundedness and certainty into your life, you can ju just focus on what you can control and surrender to the rest. And I'll give you a few examples. The first thing that will change the quality of your life and everybody listening is you harnessing the power of your own focus. There are three patterns that screw most humans and entrepreneurs or, or corporate people up. And if they're aware of them, they can then make a shift. The first one is most people all over the world. I've done this. I've done this exercise um, to over a million people live from stage. Most people spend the majority of their time focusing on all the things that they don't have in their life versus all the things that they do have in their life. Wow. What's wrong with their relationship? What's wrong with their bank account? What's wrong at work? What they don't have? I'm missing this. I'm missing that. And take a man with no legs of an arm, for example. If I woke up every single day and I didn't do the work and I just let my brain run the show and I focus on all the things that I don't have, Nick's quality of life is terrible. It's not good. And so I have to shift my focus every day, train my brain with enough repetition to always focus on the things that I do have. Wow, I have an arm. Wow, I have my heart. Wow, I can breathe. Wow, I can see. I can feel things. I have a family. I have I have brothers. I have sisters. But if I let my brain run the show, my my quality of life is going to be very bad. And we know it to be true because there's we know a bunch of people with a whole lot of money who are still pissed off and angry. They have everything. They have the cars and they have the houses and they have the nice watches and they're still pissed off and angry because they're always focused on the next level of what they don't have. So what you focus on, um, what you have or what you don't have. The other thing is most people focus and spend most of their energy on all the things that they can't control. The economy, the the economics, political, whatever it is, the the business going up and down. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can't control. And so if we control our controllables, our whole entire life will change. And the few things that we can control are, one, our focus. You can control your focus and you can shift your focus as fast as you want. The second thing that you can control is the content that you're consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. Most people's news feed is full of negativity, horror, trauma, the terrible things. And so what you consume, you become. We're all in agreement to that. And then the third and final thing, which is one of the most difficult things that you can control, is the people that you surround yourself with on a day-to-day -day basis. The truth is, if you're not evaluating and reevaluating your circle, I can assure you, my hallucination is that 80% of people in your life are probably holding you back and you don't even know it. And sometimes it's your closest family and friends. And so I always tell people, don't cut these people off, but there's some people in your life right now, as these people are listening to this show, that you need to love from afar. 
There's just some some people in your life that you can't have specific conversations with. You can't share specific ideas with. You can't have deep, meaningful relationships with. It just it is what it is. And so you have to be very conscious of your focus, the content that you're consuming, and the people that you surround yourself with on a day to day basis. If you really want to destroy your life, tell your big goals to someone who's closed minded, and you'll be shut down immediately. Well, by the way, boy, Jackie, are we lucky to have started this program? I got to tell you. I have a big gratitude stone behind me that has Nick's name on it. Trust me. He's taught me a lot and not because he's on this podcast and everything he said. It's so true. I mean, we sound some of my closest friends I love and they're negative. I, we all have our negativity, including me, but I noticed that sometimes people are not happy for you. I'm happy for everybody. My competitors, everybody, you know, in life, you have to give back. You know, I um I just renovated my house. I was going to sell my furniture. Instead, I donated to Habitat for Humanity. You have to give back in life. You know, it that's what it's all about. God gives you something and you pay it forward. So really what you folks are saying, Nick, what you're saying is that focus on the things that you can control, not so much on the things that you can't control. Um and and order your life in such a way that you focus on the things that you can flourish rather than the things that you can't change. I'm never going to be a nuclear physicist. Ain't going to happen. You know, so, you know, accept what you can't, what you can't change. So, Nick, let's get into the, for the last sessions here, the last few minutes here. So what do you try to impart when you do a corporate event? What do you try to help the attendees accomplish and that to help the sponsors accomplish um, at these events. Absolutely. So my, my approach is a bit different. And I also teach communicators and speakers how to monetize as well. So I see a bunch of patterns, but I can, I can, I can tell you based on my observation that most speakers and corporate trainers are just like, this is what I can do for you. And I'm the total opposite. It's like, I don't know exactly what my training is going to be until we do a discovery call and you help me identify all your needs, all your challenges, all your roadblocks, all the messaging that you want to anchor so I can package the talk and the training specifically for you. It's like a la carte. And so I don't want to come in and say, hey, this is my message and this is all I can do for you. I'm more interested in the data. I believe that oftentimes as humans and entrepreneurs, we try to create things based off what we think people need. And I'm a big believer in just like ask your people. Ask the audience, ask the ask the, the CEOs what they need and what their challenges are, and then cultivate your program around that. But if I can give you a foundational answer, my intention is to give these corporations tools and strategies that allow them to access different parts of them, bring their community together, bring their mission forward, help them communicate better in difficult situations, increase mental wellness and mental health within the organization, making sure people are not only fulfilled in business, but when they go home, they have an amazing life. I mean, this is this is not just a, a, a training where we're talking about motivation. I want to give you tools where you can go heal things and change your whole bloodline forever. You know, there's a specific law that we talk about called the law of exposure. And what the law of exposure states is the moment I'm exposed to a greater way of selling, a greater way of serving, a greater way of leading, a greater way of communicating, the moment I'm exposed, I can never be unexposed again. I can never see life the same. And so ultimately, my intention is to expose you to information that once you know it, you can never do life the same and you're going to totally change your life because now you have the tools. But the truth is, most people just don't have the tools. They weren't given them. They didn't have access. And in 2024, moving into 2025, we can all agree we're in the information era. And the most dangerous information is the information that we don't know. And so I just want to expose them the information. And if they want to take it, they take it. If they don't, they'll, ex they'll experience their blessing at a different timeline. So how do you give me a little, give us a few more details as to how you bring that to life in a way that can't be done in a Zoom? Like you're sharing great wisdom with us today. We're going to summarize that in a print article, a digital article. So if they don't want to watch the show, they're still going to have an opportunity to learn from you. But what can you do at a live event to really bring this to this wisdom to life that you can't do digitally or in an article or a book? Yes, yeah, so I it, yeah, hundred percent. So I've obsessed over this and I will, I will also say that it is able to be done through virtual, but I just think human connection and in-person is the most powerful thing, if that's fair to say. Now, when it comes to the corporate trainings and making something that is really impactful is cultivating exercises 
asking people the right question, and then allowing them to share with one another and create this safe container. Oftentimes people don't share or they don't express or they don't communicate because they don't feel safe. And so if I can get leaders to lead from the front and start sharing their authenticity and then their vulnerability, then all of the employees or all the people that work under them feel now compelled and they feel empowered to share what, what they're going on. And everybody acts as a mirror for one another. And so if I have a bunch of people share, even the people that aren't sharing are going to experience breakthroughs because they see themselves in their in their employees. They see themselves in their leaders. They see themselves in the, the CEO. And so I am a transformational facilitator in the sense that I create specific exercises that take people to uncomfortable places, give them the space space to communicate those things, anchor those insights while they're communicating it, and open up the room so they can share build deep, meaningful connections with one another and see people in a way that they'd never seen them. Maybe they've been working with people for five, six, seven years, and they didn't know what they're going to know about them after these trainings. It shows a totally different side of them and brings that room together. And I think just ultimately creates more deep, meaningful relationships within the organization. Well, one of the things I've observed um, in corporations is a massive amount of silos and conflict. Um, where sales and marketing and HR often don't get along. You've seen you know, a million people that you've spoken and uh, countless organizations. To what degree do you, do you think a lot of companies are hampered by silos and, and, and inner conflict and a lack of harmony in interests? Is that a problem? It seems to me that that's a major problem, but maybe I'm wrong. I've never, I have not talked to a million people. What's your view? Yeah, I totally agree. And if I could be direct, it it's, it always comes down to the leader, the psychology of the leader. And if we're true leaders, we're going to take ownership. And so typically the biggest bottleneck is the CEO psychology and their belief system and the way that they're doing things. And so I think ultimately, I definitely seen that as a problem and a challenge. But I also believe, and this is why I've dedicated my life to it, is most of our challenge and our problems and our animosity or the separation can be healed or brought together by direct, authentic communication, creating a safe space so marketing can, can communicate their needs and sales can create uh, communicate their needs and see how you can come together and make a effortless, flowing synergy, right? But but there's a there's a lot of game of like telephone. They said this, they said this. It's just there's a breaking command of communication, and so I think bringing all of those silos together or all those departments together, communicating their, their needs, what's the best way to solve this problem and bring each other together. Most of this stuff can be healed through communication, but people don't know how to communicate in a direct way, in a safe way without pissing people off or triggering them. So assuming then that there's a cost, that, that the lack of harmony toward a common purpose, goals, and objectives is costing us money, as probably is. How prevalent do you think, if you had to guess, just as a consumer, as a, somebody who, you know, what is the prevalence of a lack of harmony in organizations? Is it normal for companies to have high levels of harmony? Or do you think that a lot of companies suffer from a lack of harmonized interests? It's a great question. I think a lot of companies have people who have great IQ, but they don't have great EQ. I think they're really smart in one way, like logic and systems and SOPs. But when it comes to emotional intelligence and communicate things and heal things, they don't have the tools or they weren't given the tools or they weren't exposed to it. And that's one of the greatest things I think we can do is not only elevate the IQ, but also elevate the EQ so we can have a more harmonious or you know harmonious organization. And so I think it's, I think it's not as popular. But I think it's becoming more popular as we see this as a massive need and, you know, upgrading people's emotional intelligence. But emotional intelligence will only go as far as the CEO wants it to go. And so if they don't think it's important and they don't see the value in it and they just want to stick to the old ways and the SOPs and just hammer people and do it the old school way, they'll, they'll always be a cap on their growth. And so it's for the organizations and the corporations that their brain is open, their souls are open, and their heart is open, and they know there's a next level for themselves and their people. Those are the ones that are open to evolution with emotional intelligence. So, Jackie, you've been in business for um, just a few years. Are you noticing finally beginning of a change from the old sort of um, command and control leadership where, you know, everybody's in their silos, everybody's in their cubicles, to really a higher degree. Do you, do you think there's a change that we're beginning to move toward a more human type of leadership that uh, Nick is referring to? I'm hoping so. You know, mm -hmm. I um, 
I notice people are dressing. You know, there's a, a a yin and a yang. I'm noticing that the um, the new people that are coming up into the the you know the realms of the world, um, they're dressing more casual. They, you know, they're not dressing. Um, um, they're not dressing business. You know, they don't take pride in themselves when they're going out to meetings. I have to say this because I go out to meetings. I just went to the IMAX show and I saw a lot of very key people and some were dressed fabulous. Like if you go to the Wins booth, they are always immaculate. They look like they just stepped out of a, you know, a fashion plate for business. Now, and if you walk around, you see people in ripped jeans. And, you know, I went to a meeting, there were ripped jeans and t-shirts. And I mean, and I guess that's fine for them. It's the new way of the world, you know, but um, I think the, the the big part with me is face-to-face -face customer service. Know your customers, learn them. I become friends with my customers. I want to know about them. I want to know what makes them tick. I want to know about their organization. I look at their websites. I find out about their new product. You have, um, information is key. Like knowledge is key. Like Nick says, Nick is a life changer and he makes you really look into yourself like, am I paying attention? What do I need to do to change my life, to get rid of the negative and bring the positive to my business, to my family every day? And I think that um, people are becoming, there's more awareness out there and there's more speakers out there and companies reaching out to people like Nick that want to make a difference because there's a lot of, you know, uptight, you know, and um, we need to go to work. We need to have a smile. We need to be happy. I'm doing this 48 years. I love waking up every morning. You know, if you lose a job, you go, I'm glad you got that job. I'm going to work hard to get the next one. I mean, you have to wake up and release the negativity. Nick creates a purpose when he's speaking. He makes people find their purpose. What is your purpose? What is your goal? Not only personally, but in business. And focusing on the things that you can change. Yeah. Nick, thank you so much for your time uh, and your wisdom. Uh, and if, uh, folks, this uh, show will be available uh, in, in the next week or so in the, the feature article. Uh, and uh, Jackie, thank you again for recommending Nick for the show. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, Nick. Thank you.